The Battle of Warsaw, also known as the Miracle on the Vistula, was a series of battles that resulted in a decisive Polish victory in 1920 during the Polish-Soviet War. Poland, on the verge of total defeat, repulsed and defeated the Red Army. After the Polish Kiev offensive, Soviet forces launched a successful counterattack in summer 1920, forcing the Polish army to retreat westward in disarray. The Polish forces, seemed on the verge of disintegration and observers predicted a decisive Soviet victory. The Battle of Warsaw, was fought from August 12 to 25, 1920 as Red Army forces commanded by Mikhail Tukhachevsky approached the Polish capital of Warsaw, and the nearby Modlin fortress. On August 16, Polish forces commanded by Józef Pilsudski counterattacked from the south, disrupting the enemy's offensive, forcing the Russian forces into a disorganized withdrawal eastward, and behind the Niemen River. Estimated Russian losses were 10,000 killed, 500 missing, 30,000 wounded, and 66,000 taken prisoner, compared with Polish losses of some 4,500 killed, 10,000 missing, and 22,000 wounded. The defeat crippled the Red Army, Vladimir Lenin, the Bolshevik leader, called it an enormous defeat for his forces. In the following months, several more Polish follow-up victories secured Poland's independence and led to a peace treaty with Soviet Russia and Soviet Ukraine later that year, securing the Polish state's eastern frontiers until 1939. The politician and diplomat Edgar Vincent regards this event as one of the most important battles in history on his expanded list of most decisive battles, since the Polish victory over the Soviets halted the spread of communism further westwards into Europe. A Soviet victory, which would have led to the creation of a pro-Soviet communist Poland, would have put the Soviets directly on the eastern border of Germany, where considerable revolutionary ferment was present at the time. Chapter 1 Prelude. In the aftermath of World War I, Poland fought to preserve its newly regained independence, lost in the 1795 partitions of Poland, and to carve out the borders of a new multinational federation from the territories of their former partitioners, Russia, Germany, and Austria-Hungary. At the same time in 1919, the Bolsheviks had gained the upper hand in the Russian Civil War, having dealt crippling blows to the Russian White Movement. Vladimir Lenin viewed Poland as a bridge to bring communism to Central and Western Europe, and the Polish-Soviet war seemed the perfect way to test the Red Army's strength. The Bolshevik speeches asserted that the revolution was to be carried to Western Europe on the bayonets of Russian soldar, and that the shortest route to Berlin and Paris lay through Warsaw. The conflict began when Polish head of state Józef Pilsudski formed an alliance with the Ukrainian leader Simon Petliura, and their combined forces began to push into Ukraine, liberating Kiev on May 7. The two sides were embroiled in the Polish-Ukrainian war, amidst competing territorial claims. After early setbacks against Poland in 1919, the Red Army was overwhelmingly successful in a counteroffensive in early 1920 that nullified the Polish Kiev operation, forcing a Polish retreat. By mid-1920, Poland's very survival was at stake and foreign observers expected it to collapse at any moment. The Russian strategy called for a mass push toward the Polish capital, Warsaw. Its capture would have had a major propaganda effect for the Russian Bolsheviks, who expected the fall of the Polish capital not only to undermine the morale of the Poles, but to spark an international series of communist uprisings and clear the way for the Red Army to join the German Revolution. The Russian 1st Cavalry Army under Semyon Budyani broke through Polish lines in early June. The effects of that were dramatic, Budyani's success resulted in a collapse of all Polish fronts. On July 4, Mikhail Tukhachevsky's Western Front began an all-out assault in Belarus from the Berzina River, forcing Polish forces to retreat. On July 19 the Red Army seized Grodno, on July 22 the Brzezisk fortress was captured and on July 28, it reached Białystok. In early August, Polish and Soviet delegations met at Boronivishi and exchanged notes, but their talks came to nothing. Chapter 2 – Orders of Battle Chapter 2 – Section 1 – Polish Three fronts, seven armies, 
a total of 32 divisions, 46,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, 730 machine guns, 192 artillery batteries, and several units of tanks. Fronts Northern Front, 250 km, from East Prussia, along the Vistula River, to Modlin. Fifth Army First Army, Warsaw Second Army, Warsaw Central Front Fourth Army, between Deblin and Kok Third Army, between south of Kok and Brody Southern Front, between Brody and the Dniester River Chapter 2 Section 2, Soviet Chapter 3, Battle Plans Chapter 3 Section 1, Polish By the beginning of August, the Polish retreat had become more organized, as their supply lines were steadily shortened. At first, Józef Pilsudski wanted to stop the Soviets at the Bug River and the city of brest litovsk but the Soviet advance resulted in their forces breaching that line, making that plan obsolete. On the night of August 5 6, Pilsudski, staying at the Belwida Palace in Warsaw, conceived a revised plan. In the first phase, it called for Polish forces to withdraw across the Vistula River and defend the bridgeheads at Warsaw, and at the Wieprz River, a tributary of the Vistula southeast of Warsaw. A quarter of the available divisions would be concentrated to the south for a strategic counteroffensive. Next, Pilsudski's plan called for the first and second armies of General Józef Alej's Central Front to take a passive role, facing the Soviet main westward thrust and holding their entrenched positions, Warsaw's last line of defense, at all costs. At the same time, the Fifth Army under General Władysław Sikorski, subordinate to Alej, would defend the northern area near the Modlin Fortress, when it became feasible they were to strike from behind Warsaw, thus cutting off Soviet forces attempting to envelop Warsaw from that direction, and break through the enemy front and fall upon the rear of the Soviet Northwestern Front. Additionally, five divisions of the 5th Army were to protect Warsaw from the north. General Franciszek Latinik's 1st Army would defend Warsaw itself, while General Boleslav Roja's 2nd Army was to hold the Vistula River line from Gora Kalwaria to Deblin. The crucial role, however, was assigned to the approximately 20,000 strong, newly formed, task force, under the personal command of Pilsudski. This unit, composed of the most elite Polish units from the Southern Front, was to be reinforced by General Leonard Skierski's 4th Army and General Zygmunt Zielinski's 3rd Army. After retreating from the Bug River area, those armies had not moved directly toward Warsaw but had crossed the Wieprz River and broken off contact with their pursuers, thus confusing the enemy as to their whereabouts. The assault group's assignment was to spearhead a rapid offensive from their southern position in the Vistula Wieprz River Triangle. They were supposed to advance north, targeting a weak spot that the Polish intelligence thought to have found in between the Soviet western and southwestern fronts, where their communications relied on the weak Moser group. The aim of this operation was to throw the Soviet Western Front into chaos and separate it from its reserves. According to the plan, Sikorsky's 5th Army, and the advancing assault group, would meet near the East Prussian border, leaving the Soviets trapped in an encirclement, although based on fairly reliable information provided by Polish intelligence and intercepted Soviet radio communications, the plan was called amateurish by many high-ranking army officers and military experts. From Polish officers to the advisers from the French military mission to Poland who were quick to point out Pilsudski's lack of formal military education. Criticism was levied on the logistical side, as suggested concentration points were as far as 100 to 150 miles from many Polish units, most of them engaged on the front lines, and all of that a mere week before the planned date of the counterattack. All regrouping was within striking distance of the enemy, if Pilsudski and his staff mistimed when the Soviet offensive would begin, the Polish counterattack and even the cohesion of the entire Polish front would be in chaos. Pilsudski himself admitted in his memoirs that it was a gamble, he decided to go forward with it due to politicians' defeatist stance, fear for the safety of the capital, and the prevailing feeling that if Warsaw were to fall, all would be lost. 
only the desperate situation persuaded other army commanders to go along with it. They realized that under the circumstances, it was the only possible way to avoid a devastating defeat. The plan seemed so desperate and inept, that when the Soviets intercepted a copy of it, it was discarded as a poor deception attempt. The authorship of the plan is a matter of some controversy. Due to Pilsudski's political image, he was largely unpopular with the right wing of Polish politics. Furthermore, Podorewski told top allied leaders that Wegon had the idea, Podorewski knew better, but he was trying to use American support for a comeback in Polish politics. After the battle, many reports suggested that the plan was in fact prepared either by the French General Maxime Wegon, or by the Polish Chief of Staff Tadeusz Jordan Rozwodowski. According to recent research, the French military mission proposed only a minor tactical counterattack of two divisions towards Minsk Mazowiecki. Its aim would have been to push the Red Army 30 kilometers back in order to ease subsequent ceasefire negotiations. On the other hand, General Rozwodowski's plan called for a deeper thrust into Russian lines from the area of Wipras. However, Pilsudski proposed a large-scale operation, with significant forces committed to beating the enemy forces rather than merely pushing them back. The plan was opposed by the French mission, which did not believe that the Polish army would be able to regroup after a 600-kilometer retreat. Nonetheless, for many years, a myth persisted that it was the timely arrival of Allied forces that had saved Poland, a myth in which Wegon occupied the central role. Davis points out Pilsudski was left with only one serious possibility, a counter-offensive to the right of center, at a point where a strike force could be assembled from both northern and southern fronts. He pondered and checked these considerations during the night of 5 to 6 August, ruminating alone in his study at Belwida in Warsaw. In the morning, he received Rozwodowski and together they worked out the details. Rozwodowski pointed out the value of the river Wipras, by the evening, Order No. 8358 thirds, was ready and issued. General Vagon admitted in his memoirs that La Victoire était Polonaise, Le Plan Polonais, L'Armée Polonaise 197 to 198, 222. Chapter 3 Section 2 Russian Mikhail Tugachevsky planned to encircle and surround Warsaw by crossing the Vistula River, near Wuklork, to the north and south of that city, northwest of Warsaw, and launch an attack from the northwest. With 24 divisions in four armies under his command, he planned to repeat the classic maneuver of Ivan Paskevich, who in 1831, during the November Uprising, had crossed the Vistula at Torun and reached Warsaw practically unopposed, crushing the Polish Uprising. This move would also cut the Polish forces off from Gdansk, the only port open to shipments of arms and supplies. The main weakness of the Russian plan was the poorly defended southern flank, secured only by the Pinska marshes and the weak Mazir group. That unit consisted of the 57th Infantry Division, 8,000 strong, and acted as the link between the Soviet two fronts. Davis argues that the Soviet failure was caused by its tardiness in moving forces in for a frontal attack on Warsaw. By contrast the Poles were speedy, making every day's delay a liability to the Soviets. Furthermore, there was poor coordination between the Soviet Western Command and the three armies of the Southwestern Command. In the political sphere, Davis argues, there was too much friction inside the Soviet Command. According to the historian Thomas Fiddick, rumors of disobedience to orders on the Soviet side by General Semyon Budyani, or possibly even Joseph Stalin, were baseless. Moscow had decided for political reasons to reinforce the Crimean front at the expense of the Polish front. It meant it was replacing its goals of Europe-wide communist revolution with a sort of peaceful coexistence with the West amidst internal consolidation. Chapter 4 Battle Chapter 4 Section 1 First Phase While the Red Army pushed forward, Gekchishkian's cavalry corps, together with the Fourth Army, crossed the Kra River and advanced towards the town of Wuklork, the 15th and 3rd Armies were approaching Modlin Fortress and the 16th Army moved towards Warsaw. 
The final Russian assault on Warsaw began on August 12. The Soviet 16th Army commenced the attack at the town of Radzymin, and captured it the following day. This initial success of the Red Army prompted Pilsudski to move up his plans by 24 hours. The first phase of the battle started on August 12, with a Red Army frontal assault on the Praga bridgehead. In heavy fighting, Radzymin changed hands several times and most foreign diplomats left Warsaw, only the British and Vatican ambassadors chose to remain. On August 14, Radzymin fell to the Red Army and the lines of Władysław Sikorski's Polish 5th Army were broken. The 5th Army had to fight three Soviet armies at once, the 3rd, 4th, and 15th. The Modlin sector was reinforced with reserves, the Siberian Brigade and General Franciszek Krajowski's fresh 18th Infantry Division, both elite, battle-tested units, the 5th Army held out until dawn. The situation was saved around midnight when the 203rd Ulan Regiment managed to break through the Red Army lines and attack a Soviet command post, which resulted in a destruction of a radio station of A.D. Shuvayev's Soviet 4th Army. The latter unit had only one radio station left, fixed on one frequency which was known to the Polish intelligence. Since the Polish codebreakers did not want the Russians to find out that their codes had been broken, the remaining Soviet radio station was neutralized by having the radio station in Warsaw recite the Book of Genesis in Polish and Latin on the frequency used by the 4th Army. It thus lost contact with its headquarters and continued marching toward Torun and Płock, unaware of Tukhachevsky's order to turn south. The raid by the 203rd Ullans is sometimes referred to as the Miracle of Chikanov. At the same time, the Polish 1st Army under General Franciszek Latinik resisted a direct Red Army assault on Warsaw by six rifle divisions. The struggle for control of Radzymin forced Józef Ale, commander of the Polish Northern Front, to start the 5th Army's counterattack earlier than planned. During this time, Pilsudski was finishing his plans for the counteroffensive. He decided to supervise the attack, personally handing in a letter of resignation from all state functions, so he could concentrate on the military situation and so that if he died, it would not paralyze the state. He succeeded in raising the morale of the troops, between August 12 and August 15, visiting units of the 4th Army concentrating near Puloy, about 100 kilometers south of Warsaw. At that time, Pilsudski also commented on the dreadful state of logistics of the Polish army, in the 21st Division, almost half of the soldiers paraded in front of me barefoot. The newly created Polish army, a little choice in its equipment, its rifles and artillery pieces were produced in at least six countries, each of them using different ammunition. Chapter 4 Section 2, Second Phase the 27th Infantry Division of the Red Army managed to reach the village of Isabelin, 13 kilometers northwest of the capital, but this was the closest that Russian forces would come. Tukhachevsky, certain that all was going according to plan, was actually falling into Pilsudski's trap. There were only token Polish resistance in the path of the main Russian advance north and across the Vistula, on the right flank of the battle. At the same time, south of Warsaw, on the battle's left front, the vital link between the northwestern and southwestern fronts was much more vulnerable, protected only by a small Soviet force, the Moser Group. Further, Semyon Budyani, commanding the 1st Cavalry Army, a unit much feared by Pilsudski and other Polish commanders, disobeyed orders by the Soviet High Command, which at Tukhachevsky's insistence, ordered him to advance at Warsaw from the south. Budyani resented this order, influenced by a grudge between commanding southwestern front generals Alexander Ilyich Yegorov and Tukhachevsky. In addition, the political games of Joseph Stalin, at the time the chief political commissar of the southwestern front, further contributed to Yegorov's and Budyani's disobedience. Stalin, looking for personal glory, aimed to capture the besieged Lvov, an important industrial center. Ultimately, Budyani's forces marched on Lvov instead of Warsaw, and thus missed the battle. The Polish 5th Army counterattacked on August 14, crossing the Ukra River. It faced the combined forces of the Soviet 3rd and 15th Armies. The struggle at Nazielsk lasted until August 15 and resulted in near complete destruction of the town. 
However, the Soviet advance toward Warsaw and Modlin was halted at the end of August 15, and on that day Polish forces recaptured Radzymin, which boosted the Polish morale. Dot from that moment on, Sikorsky's 5th Army pushed exhausted Soviet units away from Warsaw, in an almost blitzkrieg like operation. Sikorsky's units were given the support of almost all of the small number of mechanized units, tanks and armored cars, that the Polish army had, as well as that of the two Polish armored trains. It was able to advance rapidly at the speed of 30 km a day, disrupting the Soviet enveloping northern maneuver. Chapter 4 Section 3, Third Phase On August 16, the Polish assault group commanded by Pilsudski began its march north from the Wieprz River. It faced the Mazir group, a Soviet corps that had defeated the Poles during the Kiev operation several months earlier. However, during its pursuit of the retreating Polish armies, the Mazir group had lost most of its troops and had been reduced to only one or two divisions covering a 150-kilometer front line on the left flank of the Soviet 16th Army. On the first day of the counteroffensive, only one of the five Polish divisions reported any sort of opposition, while the remaining four, supported by a cavalry brigade, managed to advance north 45 kilometers unopposed. When evening fell, the town of Wodawa had been liberated, and the communication and supply lines of the Soviet 16th Army had been cut. Even Pilsudski was surprised by the extent of these early successes. The assault group units covered about 70 kilometers in 36 hours. As planned, it split the Soviet fronts, disrupting the offensive, all without encountering any significant resistance. The Mazir group had already been defeated on the first day of the Polish counterattack. Consequently, the Polish armies found what they had hoped for, a large opening between the Soviet fronts. They exploited it ruthlessly, continuing their northward offensive with two armies following and falling on the surprised and confused enemy. On August 18, Tukhachevsky, in his headquarters in Minsk, some 300 miles east of Warsaw, realized the extent of his defeat, quickly issuing the orders for the Red Army to retreat and regroup. He wanted to straighten the front line to improve his logistics, regain the initiative and push the Poles back again, but the situation had progressed beyond salvaging. His orders either arrived too late or failed to arrive at all. Soviet General Pshishkian's 3rd Cavalry Corps continued to advance toward Pomerania, its lines endangered by the Polish 5th Army, which had finally managed to push back the Red Army and switched over to pursuit. The Polish 1st Legion's Infantry Division, in order to cut the enemy's retreat, carried out a forced march, going on the move for up to 21 hours a day, from Lubartow to Białystok, covering 163 miles in only six days. Throughout that period, the division engaged the enemy twice. The division's rapid advance allowed it to intercept the 16th Soviet Army, cutting it off from reinforcements near Białystok and forcing most of its troops to surrender. The Soviet armies in the center of the front fell into chaos. Some divisions continued to fight their way toward Warsaw, while others retreated, lost their cohesion and panicked. Tukhachevsky lost contact with most of his forces, and the Soviet plans were thrown into disorder. Only the 15th Army remained an organized force, it tried to obey Tukhachevsky's orders, shielding the withdrawal of the westernmost extended 4th Army. However, it was defeated twice on August 19 and 20 and joined the general route of the Red Army's northwestern front. Tukhachevsky had no choice but to order a full retreat toward the western Bug River. By August 21, all organized resistance ceased to exist, and by August 31, the Soviet southwestern front was completely rooted. Chapter 5 Aftermath Although Poland managed to achieve victory and push back the Russians, Pilsudski's plan to outmaneuver and surround the Red Army did not succeed completely. On July 4, four Soviet armies of the Northwestern Front began to advance on Warsaw. After initial successes, by the end of August, three of them, the 4th, 15th and 16th Armies, as well as the bulk of Pshishkian's 3rd Cavalry Corps, had all but disintegrated, 
their remnants either taken prisoner or briefly interned after crossing the border into German East Prussia. The Third Army was the least affected, due to the speed of its retreat, the pursuing Polish troops could not catch up with it. Red Army losses were about 15,000 dead, 500 missing, 10,000 wounded, and 65,000 captured, compared to Polish losses of approximately 4,500 killed, 22,000 wounded, and 10,000 missing. Between 25,000 and 30,000 Soviet troops managed to reach the borders of Germany. After crossing into East Prussian territory, they were briefly interned, then allowed to leave with their arms and equipment. Poland captured about 231 pieces of artillery and 1,023 machine guns. The southern arm of the Red Army's forces had been routed, and no longer posed a threat to the Poles. Semyon Budyani's 1st Cavalry Army, besieging Lvov, had been defeated at the Battle of Komaro on August 31 and the Battle of Hrubiesau. By mid October, the Polish army had reached the Tarnopol Dubno Minsk Drissa line. Tukhachevsky succeeded eventually in reorganizing his eastward retreating forces, but not in regaining the initiative. In September, he established a new defensive line near Grodno. In order to break it, the Polish army fought the Battle of the Niemen River, once again defeating the Red Army. After the Battle of the Sara River, both sides were exhausted. On October 12, under heavy pressure from France and Britain, a ceasefire was signed. By October 18, the fighting was over, and on March 18, 1921, the Treaty of Riga was signed, ending hostilities. Bolshevik propaganda before the Battle of Warsaw had described the fall of Poland's capital as imminent, and its anticipated fall was to be a signal for the start of large scale communist revolutions in Poland, Germany, and other European countries, economically devastated by the First World War. Due to the Polish victory, however, the Soviet attempts to overthrow the government of Lithuania had to be cancelled. The Soviet defeat was therefore considered a setback for Soviet leaders, supportive of that plan. A National Democrat's same deputy, Stanislav Stronsky, coined the phrase, Miracle at the Vistula, to underline his disapproval of Pilsudski's earlier Ukrainian adventure. In response, Poland's Prime Minister Vincent Vitos commented, Whatever you want to write and say, whoever you want to dress in laurels and merits, this is 1920's miracle at the Vistula. Diaries from many participants of the battle attribute the outcome to the Blessed Virgin Mary citing multiple reasons, including widespread national prayer beforehand and subsequent reports of her appearance on the battlefield. The date of the turn of the battle is believed to coincide with the solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary as celebrated by Roman Catholics. Chapter 5 Section 1 – Breaking of Russian Ciphers According to documents found in 2005 at Poland's Central Military Archives, Polish cryptologists broke Russian ciphers they had intercepted as early as September 1919. At least some of the Polish victories, not only the Battle of Warsaw but also other battles, can be attributed to this. Lieutenant Jan Kowalewski, credited with the original breakthrough, received the Order of Virtuti Militari in 1921. Chapter 5 Section 2, in Polish. M. Tarzinski, Kudnad Wisła, Warsawa, 1990. Józef Pilsudski, Pismas Biro, Warsawa, 1937, reprinted by Krajowa Agencja Wydawnictwa, 1991, ISBN 8303030590. Mikhail Tukarczewski, Lectures at Military Academy in Moscow, February 7-10, 1923, reprinted in Pekodzar Weil, Ludge, 1989.